Hello, this is a um, talk on honeypots for medical devices. This is all I intend to talk in my 25 minute talk, so very much about like, you know, why, why this research, the motivation behind it. And then I know that sometimes, you know, uh, slides, especially in virtual condition, can be slightly boring, hopefully not too much though. Um, and uh, so we're going to have a very pretty long session where you will be exactly on live on the honeypot and understand how it interacts, its behavior, and how to configure it. And then the last part will be very much discussion about the results, um, lessons I learned uh, about building this honeypot. So let's um, jump straight to the content, the motivation. Well, you've got to place yourself back in March 2020, which is the beginning of this project. Um, it is uh, the first lockdown for France, at least. And anyway, um, well, there's been COVID-19 issues like everywhere um, worldwide. And so obviously, like everybody wants um, healthcare institutes and hospitals to be able to focus on patients and not to have to worry about cyber attacks. That's what, what we would want, but the reality, of course, is far different. I'm sure you know that there were several attacks on hospitals at that time, um, and uh, it didn't go down Okay, at, uh, at that period. So I thought, oh, well, what can I do there? Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can just start and build a honeypot for a medical device and um, at least it will be a bait and attackers will um, focus on that bait and while they are focusing on that bait at least they are not worrying a real hospital and during the process of course uh, maybe I can learn a little bit what a what they are doing to understand better how um, we can protect hospitals better so this is the um, the, the, the motivation behind uh, this entire project so I need a device for the honeypot, okay, to build the honeypot around. So I selected Medfusion 4000 wireless syringe. I hold absolutely no grudge against this particular device. I'm going to explain exactly why I selected that one. So first we need a device that is still used in hospitals for real. And this is the case for Medfusion 4000. It is still sold and very much active. Then I needed um, a device for which I had enough technical information to be able to, uh, to imitate it really correctly. For instance, if it has a Telnet server, I need the, what the, to know what the banner look like, looks like, um, how it is interacting, what is on the device and things uh, like that. And also, third thing, I think that uh, for attackers to be interested in the device, it's better if there are some known vulnerabilities on the device. And, well, for this Medfusion 4000, I had all three. Um, so, well, um, that's why I selected it. Right. Then a reviewer actually insisted, and thank you for mentioning this. He told me it might be uh, interesting or she might, uh, she told me, I don't know if um, who is the reviewer. It might be interesting if you um, tell us a little bit more what is a wireless syringe, because it's not obvious to everybody. And I thought, yeah, actually, it's, um, it's good. I'm going to mention that. So this is why you have connected wireless uh, syringes in hospitals. So the, the syringe, okay, it's very much like uh, an automated syringe, which is connected to the patient and is going to deliver whatever um, fluids. It can be a medicament, antibiotics, it can be blood, it can be uh, lipids, it can be something else, right? For uh, each of these fluids, of course, you have many, many parameters that you can configure, like what concentration, the doses, and things like that. And I'm going to jump to the next slide for that. For instance, in this one, well, this none is not the Medfusion 4000, but it's an infusion pump, but it, it's the same idea, okay? And this one is configured to deliver Propofol, which is um, a product which is used for anesthesia. So what you can do, you've got all this that you can uh, you can actually configure. Do you want it delivered by dose? Do you want it delivered by volume? 
what is your type of syringe? What kind of concentration do you want? Um, do you want a specific loading dose at the beginning and then less afterwards? Um, you know, there's lots of parameters that you can select for each different drug that you are going to insert in, um, in the infusion pump. So just think about it. If um, the medical staff, the nurse, the doctor, whoever is uh, going to do that, to configure the device, to do that automatically for every single patient, okay? This is gonna be loads of work, okay? And uh, it also means, unfortunately, that they are going to lose lots of time. And also that if they have to do that for 500 patients, well, unfortunately, there's there's gonna be errors. And when there's an error, okay, it's always bad for the patient. So the good thing here in having it connected, I'll go back to this one, having it connected to an ex, uh, um, a remote server, a drug library, is that the drug library has all those values with defaults or ranges uh, for uh, each drug, okay? So this is automatically loaded from the server onto the wireless syringe by wireless connection and um, it just reduces um, the amount of work that um, the medical staff would have to do and also there are some um, error reduction systems which will just check that you're not going beyond the limits um, that um, you know that so they're not doing something which is really going to be dangerous for for the patient so this is why we have connected devices in uh, hospitals. Now, the honeypot. So we are going to use the, um, the Medfusion 4000. And the Medfusion 4000 has both a telnet service and an FTP service. There's no SSH uh, on that uh, device, so we're going to need a telnet honeypot and an FTP honeypot, okay? So, for, to select the Telnet Honeypot, actually, there are many projects which do that. And you can find the complete list over here if you want to have a look at that. Um, but if you remove from that list all the projects were extremely old, those which are no longer maintained, those where the source code is not available and that you actually can't use, <clears throat> well, the, li uh, the list is going to skim down pretty much. And you don't have, in the end, that much choice um, to use something as a honeypot. Um, you've got a couple, but not really that much. In the end, I selected Carry. Carry is a very active um, uh, project, uh, open source project with a Telnet honeypot. And well, it's, you'll see it's pretty nice and interesting to, to configure and to use. So this is the part where I am going to start and do a demo on um, the honeypot. So there we are, we're going to connect to my honeypot. I've named an ATC host, it's just like um, a shortcut, my honeypot carry. Um, what is important there is that you see that it has customized banners, telnet banner here. This is the banner that you will actually see on the medical device. Same for that, this is the real banner that you would see on a real device. And then, well, we can try and log in. We can attempt any kind of password, let's say admin and bot conf. And of course, that doesn't work. But you will want, of course, to configure a couple of um, passwords that you want your honeypot to accept. For instance, operator, any kind of um, password will work in that case. And I'll use Excel just for me and my logs to know that I logged and I was doing this session. And there you see the prompt is configured. 4000, this is the real, uh, the, the real prompt that you can see on uh, this kind of medical device. And you can work as if you were on a Unix uh, machine. You've got those. For instance, this is a bait file, which uh, actually gives you the password for the Wi-Fi of uh, the medical device. This is, um, you can read that in one of the vulnerabilities I have listed before. So this is pretty much interesting, perhaps for the attacker to have a look at that. 
What else can you do? Well, you can go to another directory. Um, let's go, for instance, in RFS. And there's another interesting file. It's totally fake, of course. Okay, it's a honeypot. Um, yeah, so you can do lots of things. What else? Um, we probably want commands such as these to work. Okay, so it looks like it is a real system. Um, this one as well. We want that to work. So uh, actually, I don't know if that device is really a NARM, uh, uses a NARM processor or not, but that's what I suspected it might be running, but I'm not sure. So that's what I put on the honey pot. Um, we can do also this one to see the wireless configuration. Okay, so currently not uh, associated. Okay, it looks like it is real. We can also have a look at the process which are running. And well, you have a list which is actually tailored specifically for the honey part. And you might notice this one. This one is a specific process which is found on those wireless syringes. It's called the medical device server. So you can try that command and it will show you what you can do with that command on the medical device server. So this is pretty much something that really looks like, you know, the, the, real, the real device there. So now let's see so how we can configure the, the honeypot. There are four different um, parts where you can um, do some configuration. The main, the main part where you can do the configuration of the honeypot is in Cowrie's configuration file, okay, that you will find in the etc directory of um, the project. And this is where basically you will configure all the directories, banners, prompts, and things like that. Then, of course, uh, I told you that we could configure um, login and who to grant access to or not. Okay, so this is also some part that you can where you have to do some configuration uh, to s say how you want the honeypot to behave. Then you've got what is called um, HoneyFS, so the file system of the honeypot, which are all the files that are going to be accessible to um, to the attacker, that they can actually go, list, uh, execute, and do things on, right? Those take a little bit of space on your honeypot, so you've got to be careful if this space is an issue for you, and not to put too many files in there, of course. The other one is, the, the last part there, is the pickle file system. And um, in the pickle file system, it's virtual. You have files, but they are not uh, really accessible to the attackers. They can just be kind of listed, right? So it, it, it's a good way to save disk space while still maintaining the impression that the files are actually really there. Um, all of this, you can do lots of configuration and, uh, of course, I won't have time to go through all configuration points um, in, in this talk, but I've written an article for that that you can find here on Medium. And really, there's lots of information there, so go and, and see that if you are interested in doing your own honeypot, you will see um, how to add custom files, how to configure prompt and banners, how to create fake commands as the one, for instance, MDS that we saw, how to make some simple commands like Unix commands, CP and everything work correctly, how to customize the list of process, we saw that, okay? So you have all that, um, all that explained in that article. For this uh, presentation, I am going just to show you how to do one specific uh, configuration uh, on the honeypot. Okay, so here uh, let's, for instance, add the command SHA256 sum and try to get that working. Um, the honeypot as such currently it is it does not exist the command is not listed in USA bin where it should be there is nothing named as that 
So we've got to add it. I'm going to show you how to do that. So I go on my personal laptop here and I'm going first to add the file in the pickle file system. So it's in there. You've got all the files there that should appear in the pickle file system. It's going to be in USA bin. And here I'm just going to add to add, sorry, to uh, SHA-256 sum. You see that I'm just doing a touch. There is absolutely no real command behind it. Um, I'm gonna fix permissions to make it executable. There we go. This is good. So this is now what we have in the pickle file system and we've got to compile the pickle file system. I've got a make file for that. So it is, let's ensure everything is clean, make clean first and then make upload should do the work. It compiles, the um, creates the file system, the big old file system, and then uploads it to the real honeypot. Then there's something else we've got to fix on the honeypot. So I'm going on the honeypot itself in my carry directory share carry you'll have all the details for that in the in the article on on medium if you want more information and here i'm going to prepare um, the output for sha 256 so let's say sha 256 sum there we go. What could, what expected output could we have? Um, let's, no, let's not do it that way. Sha two hundred and sixty-six sum of, uh, I don't know, of flash call fire. There we go. I've got one. And I'm gonna put that output there. Of course, it will be fixed output. It will always actually uh, answer this uh, SHA sum for any file on the honeypot, but it won't be that obvious at first for the attacker to see uh, uh, this behavior. And now we've got to restart carry. And this is pretty simple, carry restart. So it has closed the session. We are going to restart it. Operator Excel. And now we are going to try share 256 sum on config.xml. And there you get you get your share sum. So now about FTP honeypots. Um, well, I searched on the internet, but I couldn't find any product I really liked. So in the end, I, I did my own. Um, which you can find on GitHub, GitHub Cryptax uh, Melting Pot. There it is. Uh, you should have everything you need. It is a working. It's pretty simple actually to code, and it supports the passive mode, which is what much um, most FTP servers do. Um, it will log everything you do on the honeypot uh, into a JSON file that you can afterwards uh, pass to uh, Elasticsearch and everything. Um, everything is running inside the Docker container also, so um, this is pretty handy because that way you're not touching your own uh, real uh, host, which is always good. I'm going to show you what it's meant to look like. Okay, so if I'm like an attacker, I'll do FTP carry. Um, I can log in as anonymous. Anony there we go and we use the passive mode and there we do ls and well you see we can get um, a list of files and we can get one if we want um, let's get again config.xml and there the transfer is complete and you can actually list it from here okay so basically it is uh, working there um, what else can I say there? So go back to the slides. We will jump to ELK. 
now that we have all those attacks coming on our Telnet honeypot and our FTP honeypot, well, we've got to process all those logs. And this is what Elasticsearch is going to do for us. Elasticsearch, Elastic, Elasticsearch Logstash, Kibana, ELK. Um, I am probably a noob at using the solution because I find it extremely um, uh, interesting, but very, very heavy. Um, it's far from a lightweight solution, as you can see. Um, but it's worth it, to be honest, because what you're going to have to do is to get all your uh, logs from your honeypot, the Telnet honeypot and the FTP honeypot, feed that in to file beat, then feed that in to Logstash on a specific port, which sends it to another port on Elasticsearch, which sends it to Kibana, which is for the front end uh, to view everything, which actually makes that available to, well, basically a web server and that you can access remotely on port 9500, uh, 9, in my case, but of course, totally configurable. And then you are so happy because you can boast with uh, absolutely great and gorgeous graphs like those. Well, 25 minutes is pretty short, but I'm going to try and um, sum up a little bit of the attacks which occurred on the honeypot. Uh, first thing, well, there's an enormous amount of attacks on the honeypot. Uh, 1.2 million attempts uh, of login attempts per day. So that, that, that's really enormous. Uh, but only a small, very small part of this is actually successful in logging because, uh, well, I have configured uh, intentionally my honeypot only to have uh, to accept passwords that would um, potentially exist on a medical device, uh, etc. What you probably want to know is are there some attacks where you have uh, people which are trying uh, medical passwords? Well, uh, the answer is um, perhaps, but not sure because um, we do see some very generic uh, combinations such as service, service, user, user uh, over there, which are credentials which are used on medical devices. Okay, so it could be an attack for a medical device. On the other hand, those uh, passwords, those credentials are so generic that they are used on uh, loads of other equipment. Okay, it can be an attack on an IP camera, it could be an attack on a DVR, uh, it's really difficult. So the conclusion, the conclusion is that, well, um, in this talk, you should have uh, learned how to customize Cowrie uh, as a honeypot. Um, you know that the results so far, so it has been running since March 2020, well, I haven't found any evidence of um, medical device attack. Well, an attack specifically uh, targeting a medical device. However, if you are um, some IT staff in a hospital, that doesn't mean that your medical device is um, doesn't need to be protected because they are awfully vulnerable to those um, IoT malware such as Mirai, Gavgit and Mozi and etc. So um, do pay attention to secure your medical devices against uh, those malware. Otherwise, they will get infected and uh, the malware will propagate in your network, okay? So true, the attacker is not logging in to, I don't know, modify an X-ray, modify a scan or something like that, but they will get in and uh, grab, go to um, uh, your financial department and, and get, um, I don't know, uh, um, passwords for bank, bank accounts or colonies or lots of emails to spam and things like that. So it's bad either way. But then those are, um, well, the references um, you can take away and you'll have on my slides afterwards if you want to um, have a look at that. Um, and uh, well, this is pretty much it. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I think that if I'm not over time, there's uh, there will be some slight time for questions. Uh, anyway, whatever happens, I'm always very happy to answer questions. And thank you very much for listening.